Uh, okay, uh, let's start. A good, good afternoon and good evening. And uh, evening. And well, and uh, first of all, I would like to, uh, uh, behalf, in, on behalf of the staff and the, the, our new director, and to welcome uh, everyone to come this uh, special uh, neighborhood event. And uh, uh, it's really a great day outside, and uh, we see lots of friends and familiar faces, and come here and uh, enjoy the evening. And before I introduce our speaker, I would like to uh, give you a little bit brief uh, uh, introduction of the institution. I think uh, many of you already know and probably see on the web. And uh, this is the uh, uh, Carnegie Institution Washington, and it's a private, uh, fund, uh, uh, private research institute, but we also uh, have many uh, uh, research funded by uh, federal uh, grants and they include NSF and NASA and DOE and other federal agency and uh, we also get donations from various uh, uh, private foundation as also individuals uh, as a friend of the Carnegie's. So Carnegie has a six department and here we have two department. One is department uh, uh, terrestrial magnetism and uh, we are actually the, uh, the geophysical laboratory. And the today's speaker is from the geophysical laboratory. And in fact, actually many of, uh, some of the neighborhood people maybe know, we used to locate the Upton Street. And uh, we moved here in uh, 1990 and uh, co-located with our sister, sister uh, department. And, uh, and that was moved in 1990. And actually, I was started actually in the Upton Street and, and building in 1988. And, and that's, uh, we have a very similar buildings. Now it's a music school. So if you guys draw by, you should go see. And it's uh, they renovate. It's, it's a beautiful place. But the historical building is very similar to the one here. Actually, one of the conditions they bought is they can't uh, do the modification as they declare as historical buildings. And so that was built in 1905, I think finished in 1907, and uh, the price is about $300,000. Many of you can probably afford, afford with today's price, <laughs> not, not as then the price. And, uh, uh, and uh, we really uh, kind of moved here, and, uh, uh, and uh, with our sister department, there's lots of synergy and the collaborations. But the Geophysical Lab primary has uh, three uh, major research directions. One is Earth and uh, planetary science, and one is uh, um, uh, astrobiology, and the third one is uh, uh, physics and the chemistry and materials. So today you're really going to hear and, uh, uh, our material science side of the institutions and, uh, and some of the activities and, uh, going on here. And uh, so it's my great pleasure to introduce and our youngest staff member here, and uh, Tim Strober. And uh, don't be fooled, and he looks really young, but he is young, and, but scientifically, he's not that young, actually. He has been at the institution uh, since uh, 2008. So he uh, graduated from, uh, got his PhD from uh, Colorado School of Mine. And uh, so he has been, I say, you know, and he has been uh, breaking lots of diamonds the last 10 years. And uh, so what way you come to work? You're basically breaking the precious uh, 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 stone on the earth. And, but in return, he's going to create uh, much more exciting materials. And that's what you're going to be hearing today. And so really representing and new directions in terms of making materials, how we make it in the lab, and how we make it uh, in the computers. And uh, I also do high pressure research and breaking lots of diamonds. I think one of these things in common is uh, we're always getting uh, the question from our significant others and why they don't have huge diamond and earrings. And, uh, so my standard answer, maybe I don't know what's your standard answer. My standard answer is if I come to work, Break that stone, it can't be representing our strong bonds. So we're basically, this is a, so, so, but he's making a much more harder 
stronger materials, hopefully maybe, and uh, uh, his significant other is going to get a much more precious uh, materials. And uh, let's hear what. Hello. Good evening. Uh, my, my line is actually, a diamond is not as precious enough for you. Uh, so thank you, thank you, Dr. Fay. It's a great uh, honor to, to be here this evening and to tell you about some of the research that's going on on this campus. I hope to give you a little bit of a, my vision about what the materials of the future might look like. So from about 3.4 million years ago is when we have the first indirect evidence of the use of stone tools. There were some bones that were found in Ethiopia. They have some little scratch marks on it, and the archaeologists inferred that the humanoid species existing at that time were using stone tools. Two or 3,000 BC, our much more developed species learned how to smelt metals. We learned how to make bronze from copper and tin. We later learned how to refine other ores like iron. And the materials throughout our entire existence have been so important that we name our civilization eras after them. The Stone Age, the Bronze Age, the Iron Age. Even in more modern history, it's so exciting to me and fascinating just to look back at the remarkable discoveries of materials, new materials, and examples of our exceptional mastery of existing materials. For example, the locomotive could be exemplar of our extreme ability to master steel, which is an extension of the Iron Age. Steel is iron plus carbon and some few other trace elements. Another example would be the transistor, which has shown our society the usefulness of semiconductors and has enabled everything else that we now rely on so much to have a cell phone sitting next to our bedstand. In fact, the first semiconductor, the, the transistor here, um, developed by Bell Labs, was actually made out of germanium, not silicon. And 10 years previous to this, people thought germanium was actually a poorly conducting metal. They didn't realize that it was a semiconductor. And I'll say, I think that materials challenges underscore almost every single technological innovation and perhaps societal issue we face today. We can think about questions, perhaps vain, why doesn't my cell phone battery last longer? Wouldn't, who, who's faced the challenge before of you know, a dead cell phone battery? But also perhaps more significant questions like, why doesn't the world have access to clean drinking water? And I think every challenge we can think of today, whether it's clean energy, renewable energy, uh, combating global climate change, pollution control, medical devices, advanced computing, all of these things fundamentally have material challenges. And I hope to provide my vision of how we've moved from the Stone Age to the Bronze Age to the Iron Age, perhaps now the Silicon Age. And what we're moving into now is an area of, or an era that I will call materials by design. Hope to give you an overview of this vision, era, and give you some examples of some of the research that's going on right now at this campus. So first, how do we discover materials? Perhaps some of you have heard of this term called Edisonian type research. What does this mean? Maybe some of you have heard this famous story where Thomas Edison, before a successful light bulb filament in 1879, went through some 1,000 different materials before settling on basically burnt cotton, turned to be a carbon filament, uh, later became to be uh, bamboo, as I understand it. But he went through and iterated 1,000 different trials before settling on a material with real no physical fundamental insight into what was going on. Another example of this is uh, a gentleman, a, a German chemist named Mittash. Um, he was actually fundamental in the success of the Haber-Bosch process. This process, uh, you might not be familiar with it, it's sometimes said to be the most important chemical reaction in humanity. What it does is it enables us to take nitrogen from our atmosphere, react it with hydrogen, fix that nitrogen so that we can make fertilizer. And Mittash is said to have gone through 22,000 experiments to find the right catalyst that can effectively find the material, which is now an iron-based material that we still use today. The reason this is so important is that the development of this 
in the 20th century is said to have caused our explosion, basically, a factor of four in the population of the Earth because we can produce enough food through agriculture to feed people. Think about that. And even today, this is a company called Wildcat Discovery Technologies in Southern California. They have a much more sophisticated, advanced robotic approach, but they're still doing this type of Edisonian research where now they mix different elements on the periodic table, different ingredients, testing some 3,000 materials per week, trying to test their properties to find the best property, for example, a new type of battery that can double your cell phone performance or make your Tesla go faster. So what I think we're moving into now is a different era, not just testing things aimlessly, trying to figure out what works, but actually designing materials from a fundamental understanding. And I'll argue that our advancements in computation over really the past 15 years have really allowed this to become a new era. One approach that has much merit I'll call data mining. There are some 300,000 known inorganic compounds today, more organic compounds. All of this data um, is then mined to try to find trends to discover new types of structures. For example, there's a very ambitious project, Kristen Person at Lawrence Ber Berkeley National Laboratory, called the Materials Project. They aim to calculate, using high level of theory, all of the properties of all of the materials that have ever been made. And then by using correlations and examining these data, they can find spots that are missing. This is a great battery material. This is a new type of superconductor. This is a new material that can replace structural steel. I am taking a slightly different approach, um, and I'll call this approach the ab initio approach, or from the beginning, where we're actually going to be building up materials from scratch. And we use very precise equations governed by quantum mechanics to get very accurate calculations to predict the properties of these materials. But instead of Legos, our building blocks are right here. So how would you go about designing a material with some type of specific property for some type of specific application with this list of ingredients here? And before we get to that question, I want to just share with you uh, a quote from a gentleman named John Maddox. He's a famous British biologist, and he was the editor-in-chief of a very prestigious journal called Nature. His quote says, one of the continuing scandals in the physical sciences is that it remains in general impossible to predict the structure of even the simplest crystalline solids from a knowledge of their chemical composition. So what does he mean by that? What, and this is in 1988. What, we know so much about materials in 1988. But still, we don't have the computational sophistication to tell you what the structure of sodium chloride is. You take sodium and chlorine. Who knows what the structure of this is? It's called the rock salt structure. It's a cubic structure where you have a lattice of sodium and chlorine atoms. Why is this important? And I'll, I'll make this point several times during this presentation. Structure determines properties. If you know the structure of something, you can figure out what the properties are. 1988, we had no way, just knowing that our material was made of sodium and chlorine. Of course, we knew what the structure was because we had other tools at the time. But if you just gave me a list of ingredients, I could not tell you from a purely theoretical standpoint what the structure of sodium and chlorine. It's a scandal. So let's go through a simple exercise. Let's just take one element on the periodic table. One of my personal favorites is carbon, element number six. And here are a few different types of configurations of carbon. Three-dimensional space, you could have carbon atoms that are attached as hexagons and sheets, carbon atoms that are attached in soccer ball-like shapes, uh, a random jumbled up mess of, I don't know, yarn, uh, or well-ordered structures like this. So does anyone have a guess about how many configurations, we also call them phases, could possibly exist for a single element like this, like carbon? Okay. Think about that. Let's, let's, let's take, let's take a, a sidetrack for a minute. Who knows what this is? This is Go. So this is a, a game, a strategy game, where two people to play the game, you have stones. One player plays a white stone, one player plays a black stone, and you sort of fight with specific rules for territory on this board. A Go board has vertical lines and horizontal lines that intersect, 19 vertical lines, 19 horizontal lines. 
Each player can place a stone on one of these intersecting, intersecting lines and then fight for territory on this board. So how many configurations are possible for a Go board? One configuration could look like this. One configuration could look like this. One configuration could look like this. One could look like this, and one could look like this. Anybody want to guess? What do you got? Uh, yeah, so the total number of pieces would be the, the, the 19, 19 by 19, would be the, the slots. So how many total possibilities could we have on this board? And actually, this is actually very complicated mathematics to figure this out. There's a paper I just read from um, 2016. This is a lower bound estimate on the number of configurations on a Go board. Times 10 to the 170. OK, I have no clue what that even means. <laughs> but let me put it in perspective for you. It's estimated that there are only 10 to the 80 atoms in the observable universe. There are more configurations in a Go board than there are atoms in the entire universe. Put that another way. Let's start counting those configurations. Configuration one, configuration two, configuration three. You could not count the number of configurations with the amount of time that we've had in the universe. So how in the heck can we ever learn some systematic rule about how to play Go? Did, does anyone know what happened with Go in the past three years? The computer won. For the first time, I think it was four out of five games, AlphaGo, it's, a, it's, a, uh, a, it's called a Deep Learning Artificial Intelligence, a team uh, from Alphabet Incorporated, which is Google. They developed a program that beat one of the number one ranked Go players in the world. They call it a, a Nine Dawn, I believe. The computational power is so great right now, we finally have a, algorithms that can beat the best players in Go. OK, let's go back to our question. How many configurations can exist for my carbon atom? It's actually infinity. <laughs> oh, how are we going to solve this problem? And think about it. I can move the atom 0 0.01. I can move it 0 0.001. I can move it 0 0.0001. There are an infinite number of possible configurations. How could I ever calculate what the bright structure should be? Well, it turns out we can put some simple constraints on this. Um, so we can say that 0 0.001 is the same as 0 0.001. And we can throw away all the configurations that have drastically unreasonable bond distances just that are basic um, edicts of chemistry. But still, the scaling of this problem goes as 10 to the number of atoms that are in your system. So if you just have 100 atoms, this is how many possible configurations you can have. Now, this is actually called a Google. Um, and does anyone remember what the, the order of magnitude of Avogadro's number is? 10 to the 23. So 100 atoms is nothing. So this is still an, an amazing problem. Uh, without going into any of the gory details, I'll just stay, say, we now, over the past 15 years, uh, with remarkable contributions through, from this field, it's called structure prediction. Uh, many remarkable scientists, including some of the postdocs here at Carnegie, have developed the computational artificial intelligence algorithms that can crack this problem. Absolutely amazing. But this still, this still, there's still something missing here. We can calculate these configurations now, but we have to have some way to order them. We have to have some, something to say that this, we, we know how many there are, we know what they are. Which one's better? So imagine that you're condemned to push a boulder up a hill for all of eternity. Um, you know, and let's say that these three pieces here, three uh, snapshots in time, are three configurations. Which configuration is the most favorable? Well, I mean, if I'm, if I'm pushing on this thing, I'm using so much energy to hold this rock up, I actually would prefer to be even further down on the hill where I, where I don't have to be here. I, I would rather be here. And actually, this hopefully conveys the message to you. This is actually how we rank structures by energy, things that are hard to hold up on a top of a hill are not favorable. The things that come, if we sort of extrapolate this curve as a parabola over here, the, the minimum would actually be the most favorable position. Nature tends towards the minimization of energy. A corollary of that is the maximization of entropy. Um, so now let's take this 
and make a slightly more complicated plot with the same type of analogy here. And we're looking at energy as a function of configuration. So each one of these little points represents one configuration. This is drastically simplified. We have many more configurations. But what is the most favorable point on this we call energy landscape? The lowest one, right. So actually, um, and the highest one, so let's start here. So the highest one, this could be this jumbled up mess of atoms that are unphysically close together. Uh, this one could be something that is persistent but is still not the lowest form, and this one is actually the lowest. This is a real example. The low, this is carbon at one atmosphere. The lowest energy, most stable form of carbon at one atmosphere is graphite, pencil lead. Diamond is not the lowest energy form. This is the structure of diamond, the hardest material known. But it can persist because it's sort of stuck in this valley, and you have to push a lot of, you know, put a lot of energy in this to push the boulder over the hill. We'll come back to this a little bit more in a minute. So what I'm going to show you now is an example of how one of these computational algorithms actually runs for carbon. And what I'm plotting is energy of the system as a function of generation, which I'll explain more in a second. Each one of these points represents one of the configurations. We initialize our simulation with a random configuration of atoms in this box. We throw a random smattering of carbon atoms in a box. And then the genetic algorithm, or actually this is a, it's called a particle swarm algorithm. Uh, the artificial intelligence ar algorithm, say, is learning every generation from its mistakes, trying to find the lowest energy structure. So when I start this simulation, these are the structures the computer algorithm is trying, calculating the energy, and then in the next generation it learns. So a couple of the trends that you might see here is the global minimum, the lowest point it finds, is gradually getting lower and lower. Sometimes it makes a mistake, it learns, it needs to go back down again. Makes it, it goes back up, it comes back down again, and then finally, 13th generation, boom. We found the equilibrium lowest energy structure of carbon at high pressure. The simulation was at high pressure. That's diamond. This simulation, we use very powerful computers. Um, I think this took about uh, two hours on one of the computers that we do. If you were to go home and you had sort of a modern i7 core laptop, uh, Intel processor, this would take about 20 days. Uh, so it's still not totally unfeasible, but it, it's going to be a lot of time. Um, but now we can start having fun with this. So we want to start designing materials on the periodic table. We actually have the computational power now to go through, pick different combinations, and again, if we know the structure, we know the properties. So we can just start computing. What's the best battery? What's the best this? What's the best that? Uh, here, let me give you one quick example, and this will be a topic I come back to. Uh, three elements at the same time. Boron, my favorite, carbon, and then strontium. So it seems random at this point. There's a good reason for it. So here we go, another simulation. We throw these together. Now this is a much bigger simulation. Many more atoms are involved in this simulation. But this, the, conceptually, this is exactly the same. We're trying to find the lowest energy, uh, many more generations, and the, the, the algorithm is learning. It's learning that as it progresses, it's tracking lower and lower, lower energy, finding trends in the structures. They're vastly different structures that you, as you look here. Some of them are layered, some of them are extended, and finally, there it is. Uh, now, we believe this to be an actual super material that I'm going to come back to towards the end of the, the presentation, but this is how we eventually came to find this material that we ended up synthesizing in our laboratory. So again, structure determines properties. Carbon, graphite, lump of coal here. Hexagonal crystal structure, black and opaque. It's very soft. You can squirt the graphite powder in a lock, and it's actually a lubricant. Electrically conducting and thermally insulating. You squeeze this material at high pressure, actually give it a little temperature, you get diamond. Cubic clear crystal. The hardest material known um, actually has the highest thermal conductivity and electron mobility as well. Why is this? They're the same types of atoms. Structure, structure, structure. Hexagonal rings bonded together. Each one's connected to three atoms. Here we have a more three-dimensional structure where each carbon is bound to four atoms. That simple change in the structure has remarkable changes in the properties. OK, so let's talk about pressure a little bit. What is pressure? Pressure is simply force upon area. You lean against the wall, that force, the, the pressure is going to be the, the force on the area, surface area of my hand. Another example, a person is wearing high heels and somehow manages to balance on the back of one of the high heels as they walk. Say, let's say it's a 12 millimeter diameter. 
That's 43 atmospheres or 630 pounds per square inch of pressure. Uh, maybe I'll calibrate that for you. Um, your tires might, might have about, and your car might have about 30 pounds per square inch. Your bicycle tires, road bike tires, some cyclists are maybe about like 100 pounds per square inch. So it probably hurts to get stepped on by a high heel. Uh, pressure also has many units, uh, unfortunately. Um, so we have atmospheres, bars, pascals, PSI, tor, millimeters, mercury, inches of water. Tonight I would like to propose to you a more simplistic unit. And all we need is one number two pencil and an elephant. It has to be an African elephant, actually. And we can take the pencil straight out of the box. It doesn't have to be sharpened. If we balance this elephant on top of this number two pencil, this generates what we call one gigapascal, or 10 kilobar. Um, so if I, I'll use the unit gigapascal a lot in the remainder of this presentation. So please just think of this as one elephant balancing on a pencil. Now, 10 gigapascals, we have 10 elephants balanced. And if you have very acro acrobatically inclined elephants, you can get, even get up to 100 gigapascals. 100 elephants on a pencil. And so uh, a little more perspective here. The pressure at the surface of Earth is defined at one atmosphere, one atmosphere of pressure. Um, who has dove down to the bottom of a swimming pool before? Drop down slightly under some water. You start to feel the pressure, maybe 12 feet. It only increases by 40% in the pressure. But I don't like that. My ears feel uncomfortable when I'm at the bottom of the swimming pool. If you go down to the complete bottom of the ocean, actually the lowest point, the Mariana Trench, you'll get up to 1,000 times atmospheric pressure. If you go all the way through the mantle into the center of the core of our Earth, you get to about 3.6 million atmospheres. 360 elephants standing on a pencil. Pressure possibly has the largest range of variability of all the physical variables. From the depths of intergalactic space, the deep vacuums of intergalactic space, to the centers of a neutron star, pressure can vary by about 60 orders of magnitude. I think that might be the highest of any, any physical variable. So let's go back to our energy landscape now and think about what pressure does on materials. So we already went over this at low pressure. We know that the, the lowest energy state is this graphite structure at low pressure. But high pressure serves to manipulate our energy landscape, and it actually twists it so it makes diamond the, the, the favorable, most, uh, most favorable lowest energy structure. And someone asked me about, um, can, can these materials be destroyed once you make them? Now, because we do have this deep well here, it takes a lot of energy to get out, even when we recover a diamond back to ambient condition, it can still persist and be, although it's not the, the most stable form, it can still persist for length scales that are longer than the age of the universe. It's that stable. If you do put your diamond ring uh, under an open flame or you know, leave it on the stove, it will turn back into graphite. Don't do that. So high pressure is a remarkable playground for new types of materials. Basically, anything that we squeeze turns into something fantastic. Carbon turns into diamond. Uh, maybe you didn't know that nitrogen also turns into a diamond-like structure. This structure, however, has the highest energy content of any known material except for a nuclear reaction. Oxygen, the, the diatomic molecule that you're breathing in your lungs right now, turns into a red solid crystal at about 10 elephants per pencil. Although it no longer holds this O2 structure, it, it's O8 molecular clusters. Squeeze it to about 100 elephants per pencil, and it turns into a metal. Other metals, like sodium, when you squeeze to 150 elephants per pencil, turn transparent. H2S, hydrogen sulfide, this is the, the smelly gas that smells like rotten eggs. Squeeze this to a couple hundred elephants per pencil, and it turns into a superconductor. It conducts electricity with zero electrical resistance. This holds the world record temperature, the highest superconducting temperature ever been observed, over 200 Kelvin. And perhaps some of you um, came to Alex Goncharov's talk. Sodium chloride, I gave you the example. Simple table salt in the rock salt structure does all sorts of interesting chemistry forming sort of forbidden stoichiometries uh, or uh, ratios between elements, NaCl3. So how do we generate pressure? This is one of the key tools that we use in our laboratory. It is called a diamond anvil cell. I can um, pass one around. This was what was printing in the 3D printer. If you guessed that right, uh, I'll just hold you to your honesty. Uh, you can take that home. Make sure everyone gets to see it. Um, 
So let me show you a little bit about the diamond anvil cell. It's a piston cylinder device. So you see this piston here. I don't know if this mouse works. I'll try to do two hands laser. So there's a diamond that's glued onto this tungsten carbide support plate inside of this piston. And then there's a metal gasket that's surrounding the, the surface of the diamond. We drill a hole in this metal gasket, and then we can load our samples into this sample chamber. Typically, we'll fill this void space with a gas, and this serves as a compression medium to compress our samples. And then we simply put this piston cylinder device back together again. Oh, I'll run that. We, uh, once we put the cell back together, and it's good to see this twice, thanks to Javier Rojas for making this uh, animation. We simply put this back together. The, the scale is a couple inches, as you'll see from the model. And we just turn these screws to start driving those diamonds together into the metal. Here comes the other diamond, and it's squishing. Now, one of the great things about the diamonds is that they're transparent. Not just to visible light, so we can see these samples under the microscope, they're transparent to a very broad range of electromagnetic radiation. We can actually shine x-rays on them to determine what the structure is, or infrared laser, visible lasers, infrared light, and we can really figure out the properties and structures of these materials, the, pro the, the changes to them, under very extreme conditions. So with this diamond anvil cell technology, this is an actual diamond anvil cell here with a penny for scale in the sample chamber, the sample size is small. Pick one of your hairs out and cut off the finest tip with a razor blade. That's your sample size. But we can reach pressures, 360 elephants per pencil. That is the pressure in the center of the core of the Earth, even higher now. Typically, what we'll do is some preliminary experiments, because this type of apparatus is so versatile and easy to use, once we discover something, we'll want to scale it up to a larger quantity to make more precise measurements. This is a press called a paris Enberg press, and you can think of it like a big diamond anvil cell. Different types of anvils here that we put in, and we can get about um, at eight elephants per pencil, something the size of a small pebble, or uh, 20 elephants per pencil, like a, about the grain of, uh, size of a grain of sand. And if you go to Dr. Yingwei Fei's lab, these are the, the gigantic presses. This is a 1,500 ton press in his laboratory. Uh, for scale, I think my head would come up to about here. Um, we can sma smash samples in containers like this with tungsten carbide anvils in this gigantic press and reach the same type of volumes, but at 25 elephants per, pe elephants per pencil. Okay. For the remainder of this presentation, I'd just like to give you some examples now of things that we're actually doing along these lines now that we understand how we're designing these materials. The first example is I'm going to show you a new form of carbon that we discovered that's hard as a rock yet elastic, like rubber. Next, I'll show you a new type of silicon that we discovered that, that very efficiently absorbs sunlight. And then finally, this ternary system, the strontium car carbon boron, which I believe is a new class of cage-based supermaterials. So the wonderful world of carbon. We've already talked about graphite and diamond a little bit. Who's heard of graphene? Graphene. Uh, won the Nobel Prize in 2010. Uh, what about a Buckminster Fullerene? <laughs> Nobel Prize in 1996, nanotubes. There's so many other forms of carbon that exist that all have remarkable properties. Tensile strength, conductivity, properties that could be very useful for nanomedicine technologies. But this really scratches the surface. If we run our computational algorithms, we literally find thousands of new structures that have remarkable properties that are almost the same energy as these types of structures. So I don't want to sort of bog you down with the details here, but just in these units, 0.14, uh, these are called electron volts per atom. This is the energy difference. For scale, a Buckminster fullerene is 0.4 of those units. We know that exists. 0.4 exists. We should be able to make something that's 0 0.1, 0 0.1. It's much lower energy. But we just need clever ways to access these in the laboratory. And so I'll show you our work using glassy carbon. This work was championed by a po uh, Carnegie postdoc, Jixing Zhao. Um, and after his postdoctoral stay at Carnegie, he was hired at a, as a full professor at Ganshan University, uh, who we also collaborated with this work in Professor Tian's group. And I think you'll see why uh, after you, you see this work. Um, but glassy carbon is a graphite-like carbon, not diamond-like, but it's disordered. 
So there's no real perfect layering structure like we have in the graphite. We sort of have broken up fragments of graphite, broken up fragments of fullerite. This is an actual picture at very high magnification and a cartoon. I sort of like to think of it as carbon that exists as like a tangled up hair that you might pull out of a drain on the atomic scale. So when we think about this on our energy landscape, we know that these other structures exist. These little local minima that offer exciting properties. So our strategy to access this is to actually start with something that's high energy, like this tangled up clump of hair. So if we can start at a point like this, perhaps we can give it a, a gentle enough push that it falls into a new well without falling into the, the ground state, which is the diamond, the lowest energy. And so this is what we've done with the, with the glassy carbon. We took samples of glassy carbon, pressurized them to 25 elephants per pencil, and then heated them to different temperatures, knowing that once we reached some critical temperature, we would eventually form diamonds. And that's exactly what happened. When we heated our samples uh, somewhere between 1,000 and 1,200 degrees Celsius, we formed a diamond. And you can see this uh, diamond here. It's actually a little bit yellow because there's some nitrogen. Before it turns into a diamond, we found that the structure changed. And we measure how the structure changes using a technique called x-ray diffraction. I don't want to bog you down with, with the details. But what we do is we measure the intensity of scattered x-rays as a function of atomic distance. And so for a disordered material, we see very broad peaks in these types of spectra. So this is the, the material before we start our pressure and temperature process. And then as we heat this to higher and higher temperature, we start to see some changes here. One change, we see this first broad peak getting much sharper. That's telling us that the material is becoming much more ordered. We also see this peak is shifting to the right here. And these are atomic units here. The atoms are getting closer together. The material's density is increasing. And actually, after this process, we can recover this and physically me measure the density. So the, the starting material is a very low density material, around 1.5 grams per cubic centimeter. Graphite has a density here about 2.2 grams per cubic centimeter, and then diamonds way up here. So with increasing temperature, we continuously increase the density here, approaching graphite. And these are the actual pieces of the material that we recover. The scale is about 2 millimeters diameter by 2, mill two millimeter length. So now we have this new material. We start testing its properties. The first thing we test is a property called hardness. And I think most of you are probably conceptually familiar with hardness. Diamonds are hard. Um, talc is not. The way we measure this in the laboratory is we actually push a piece of diamond into a sample and see how the sample responds to that deformation. So we'll push a piece of diamond into the sample. There's a force, the load, and then a displacement. It goes in, or diamond goes into the sample some distance. Once we release that load, if the material springs back perfectly to the starting position, we call this perfect elastic behavior. Think of a rubber band held between your fingers. You poke it, it comes back to the exact starting position. The opposite side of that, you push your indenter into the material, and it doesn't respond back at all. This is called a perfectly plastic material. Think about an aluminum soda can. You indent that with your finger, it doesn't spring back. It stays indented. Plastic deformation. So these are the actual deformation curves indentation curves of our compressed glassy carbon material. So here's our load displacement. The raw material, we go up, and look, it almost comes back to the starting point. It recovers 86% of that energy that we put in. This is a very, very elastic material. Almost 90% of the elastic energy is re regained. And after our high temperature processing of these materials, it's still very, very elastic. You know, more than 70% of the elastic energy is retained in this material. Very highly elastic material. And we also measure the hardness in the same process. So we look at the sample after we poke it. It makes its shape. And hardness is also the same units as pressure. It's just the force of the diamond divided by the area of the mark that it makes. OK, let's look at the result. So here's a plot of the hardness as a function of that elastic recovery for various materials that are measured in the exact same way on the exact same instrument. So we can start down here. Aluminum, not very hard at all. We already know it's not very elastic at all. Rubber, on the other hand, 
And this is a special type of rubber. It's a high density rubber because the, the types of loads we're putting on here, regular rubber bands can't support. Um, this rubber you know, is, is very elastic still, over 60% elastic recovery. Here are some other materials you might be familiar with. The glassy carbon starting material itself is exceptionally elastic, but only moderate hardness. After we recover this new material, after the heat treatment, we see a very large increase in the hardness, up to uh, almost 30 gigapascals hardness. A super hard material is defined as over 40 gigapascals, so diamond is actually 100. But we have a very hard material now that's also very elastic. So I can say it's harder than a gemstone, like a sapphire, alumina here, but more elastic than rubber. Very, very interesting stuff. Uh, here's just some proof. Uh, this is a different type of hardness test. It's called the Mohs hardness test. This test, you scratch one mineral with another, and if it scratches it, you can, you can see which one's harder. So this is a single crystal of uh, alumina, which has a Mohs hardness of 9. Our material easily scratches this one. Uh, silicon carbide, Mohs is 9.5. Diamond is 10. So this material is right up there approaching the hardness of diamond. And we also measured the strength of this material. It has exceptional strength, almost 10 gigapascals of strength. Um, what we do is we normalize that strength by the weight. We're very interested in the strength to weight ratio. So we take that strength divided by the weight, or actually the density, to get this specific strength. There are very, very strong materials here. Uh, for example, this is uh, cobalt doped tungsten carbide. Very strong, but it's very heavy. So it, it's, very, it's a large energy penalty if you want to use this. Uh, you know, structural steels are down here. They're just, they're not even on the same scale. These are some of the most advanced ceramics that are produced today, uh, carbon fiber, uh, boron carbide. This is a polycrystalline diamond. Our compressed glassy carbon is almost off this chart here. State of the art, strength to weight ratio. So the question now becomes, what gives rise to these properties on the atomic scale? Well, we can put this material in a very high resolution microscope called the transmission electron microscope. And now, we start to see something very interesting. The resolution is so high, we can actually look at individual atoms. These are individual carbon atoms shown here. And we start to see order. Now, we noticed this before from our x-ray diffraction patterns, but look at these little tiny ordered lattices on the order of spacings three to five angstroms. And just to remind you, this is our tangled up hair drain starting material. So we've clearly ordered this. And, and so what we're hypothesizing is that our Disordered graphene-like sheets have interpenetrated together and bonded to form diamond-like nodes. And I think I have a, a short another demonstration here where part of the material has graphite-like character with these black balls, two-dimensional, and part of the material is fused together by these diamond-like structures. And so these are just some cartoons, but these are conceptual pictures of what the material looks like at the atomic scale where we might have these fullerenic features fused together, or graphite layers fused together, or this interpenetrating graphene lattice. So sort of what we've done is made a hybrid material that combines the properties of both graphite and diamond. We have one of the strongest materials for its weight, and we could think in the future perhaps this material could be used everything from advanced football helmets that could help protect athletes from traumatic brain injuries, or uh, new types of um, bumpers for structural materials for your car, or even materials that could be used for spacecraft to help uh, launch some of our colleagues' science into, into outer space. So, so very, uh, very interesting material. The next topic I'd like to talk about is solar energy. Several years back, the National Academy of Engineering said that making solar energy economical was the number one grand challenge of engineering. Uh, similarly, uh, DOE says the same thing. Um, we have a giant fusion reactor sitting out there. It's only eight minutes away, eight light minutes. And you've probably heard the statistics that the entire energy consumption of the world could be satisfied if you just used the, the amount of the solar, solar radiation that hits about the size of Spain. So why in the heck aren't we using this energy? The answer is simple. It's just not economically viable. Uh, we need to either improve the efficiency or reduce the manufacturing costs in order to move this technology forward. This is a perfect challenge for a new material. Okay, let's talk just a little bit about photovoltaics. Um, we all know that metals freely conduct electricity. Insulators, if you plug a fork into an electrical socket, it's not going to feel good. 
Uh, but if you put a diamond, and, and please don't try this at home, you, you won't get shocked. Uh, uh, insulating materials don't conduct electricity. Why is this? Within the electronic structure, the atomic scale of these materials, there's a gap. And there's a, it's called a forbidden energy gap, also known as a band gap. And in order to conduct electricity, the electron actually has to jump across this. And it's too big in diamond it, it, at room temperature. You just can't jump across it. Semiconductors are special. They have the same type of gap, but it's small. So you can actually start pu punching it around, like you know, manipulating this a little bit, give it a kick, and you can get electrons to jump across. And one way that you can get the electrons to jump across this gap is you can shine a light on it. So the way that a photovoltaic device works, you shine some sunlight on a semiconducting material, the electron jumps across this gap and can go around a circuit and to power a device like a light bulb. OK, well, let's think a little bit more about what would be the, the design criteria for making such a device. Well, you would want to choose a material that has the right band gap. What's the right energy for that gap so that we can utilize the most amount of energy from our sun? So this is the distribution of light that comes to Earth from our sun. This is uh, pl plotted in wavelength here, and the colors are represent the visible range. So here you have ultraviolet and infrared. But I think it's a little more revealing to look at this when you plot it in terms of energy. So a lot of the sun's radiation here, this is infrared, and then we have some ultraviolet radiation here. So where would be a really bad place to put our band gap? Well, it'd be a horrible place to put our band gap at here, like four electron volts. Um, because you're throwing away, basically, the entire amount of the solar spectrum. Now, you can put one, a band gap here, uh, and you'd think you might be able to use most of the solar spectrum, because uh, all the energy is above this value. But it turns out a lot of that energy gets wasted as heat. So there's an ideal value for the band gap. It turns out to be somewhere around the maximum here. It's about 1.3 electron volts. Um, some scientists named Shockley and Kweiser figured this out in the 1960s, and they calculated this. This is the theoretical limit. Sorry, there's nothing you can do about it because the sun is the way it is. Limit for a solar cell. Maximum efficiency is only around 30%. The best you can do is use 30% of the energy. And that, that was, by the way, accounted for in the, in the, uh, the little piece of the, the snippet of information about Spain. Okay, so where is silicon right now? Silicon has a band gap of 1.1. Uh, the current efficiencies that we have in the most advanced solar panels for silicon are about 26%. So we're really close. The theoretical limit is 32%. There's a little hump right there. Um, so now it, it, it's, it seems like it's not much, but actually if you can add 1% efficiency, all other things equal, with like a billion dollar market, uh, that actually is significant. Um, so it, it, even getting closer and closer to this is, is not something um, that should be not valued. The, the, it turns out you can be a little bit better than that theoretically. If you have a band gap of 1.34, you can get to the ultimate limit for our sun, which is 33.16%. Okay, so let's try to crystallize this uh, concept of the band gap a little more carefully. Uh, and I, I thought of an analogy that has to do with basketball, so maybe you guys can appreciate this or um, just tell me I'm silly. So imagine you shoot a hoop. And the height of this hoop is sort of our energy band gap. And we're going to have to put energy in. This is like the energy of the photon that's coming from the sun. If you don't put enough energy in, you're going to miss. And it's worthless. You're not going to do anything for your solar cell. What you really want to do is you want to put the perfect amount of energy to make a basket. Get your two or three points, depending on where he's standing here. Now what happens, you can put way too much energy in, but all of that extra energy was basically wasted. You still only get the two or three points where he's. So what you really want is the second scenario where you're throwing the exact amount of energy in. Hopefully that sort of clarifies a little bit about choosing the band gap. I don't know. Let me know if that's a horrible analogy afterward. OK, there's one more uh, detail that you need to understand about this band gap business. They come in two flavors. It's a little bit technical. One of them is called a direct band gap which means that the photovoltaic material can directly absorb sunlight, convert it into electricity. The other one's called an indirect band gap. It can't directly absorb the photon. It needs a little help. The help is actually through the assistance of an atomic vibration in the crystal. So using our basketball analogy one more time, a direct band gap is all players on the field 
can freely shoot anywhere, one shot, and make baskets. An indirect band gap, this hoop only allows assists. So you, can, you, you have to pass it to a player or get an alley-oop before you can score. Now, because you have this extra constraint, it's less probable that you'll score as many points in this game where everyone can shoot freely. So this is a much more inefficient process. It turns out that silicon is this type of game. Silicon has an indirect band gap. So there's a two-step process, actually, to absorb this light. So this is what the absorption coefficient of silicon looks like here, plotted against our solar spectrum, again, our visible. The energy gap, these are two materials. One's called gallium arsenide, one called silicon. Now, I'll just show you. These are actually the, the crystals. So this works, but the absorption of silicon is actually very low compared to this other material. The reason it works is you make the material really thick. It's not a very good absorber, so you just make it thicker so it absorbs more light. A typical absorber layer is about a third of a millimeter for silicon, whereas in this material called gallium arsenide, you only need one micron. So three, you know, all things equal, 300 times more material um, to, to get this thing to run. And when we think about silicon, you know, you're thinking about these clean rooms where you have to have six nines purity. If you look at it the wrong way, it's not going to work properly. Um, so if that material has to be so pure and it has to be 300 microns thick, electrons are tiny, the material has to be so free of defects and so pure um, in order to work before, or otherwise, the electron is going to get trapped at a defect and scattered, and your, your photovoltaic isn't going to work, uh, that this becomes a very expensive process. Now, let's not throw silicon away yet, because there are so many advantages of silicon. First of all, silicon is the second most abundant element in Earth's crust. Um, so it potentially could be a, a, a cheap resource. The physics and processing are very well understood. All of our technology, we have a whole valley in California named after this element. I don't, know, I don't know of any other um, elemental valleys. Um, it has very high stability. It's non-toxic. It interfaces with all of our existing technology. It's just this darn indirect band gap. Wait a minute. What if we could make a material that was still silicon, but had a direct band gap? Light bulb. And so we throw silicon into our computer. We start calculating some new structures. And we come up with these ones. Um, this one here. Uh, it has a pretty bigger indirect band gap, 1.9. We want like 1.3, 1.4. This one's interesting. Uh, this has a band gap of 1.35. It's basically a direct. This one's also 1.4, direct band gap. And the energy above the known, the known form of silicon that we use today is very small. So if we go back to our concept of the energy landscape, our normal silicon could be here. But we have tons of other choices that are just marginally higher energy. We just need a clever way to make them in the lab now. This should work. Um, so let's look at this one, for example. And this structure here, the, the strategy that we use to make this, we actually successfully made this form of silicon. Uh, we call it SI24, because it has 24 atoms in the structure. Notice it has these big channels in it. And so we played a little trick. And instead of synthesizing this directly, we used something that could stuff those channels as sort of a template and let the structure form around it. And so we formed this structure. It's called sodium 4 silicon 24, and these sodium atoms are stuffing this structure. Then we simply suck the sodium atoms out when we're done. We call this a high pressure precursor process. We use this to make this uh, slightly higher energy form of silicon that has an almost direct band gap. And so what is the consequence of this? Let's go back to our plot here with our solar energy, the absorption of light, regular silicon that we have in our solar panels today, state of the art gallium arsenide. By the way, who wants a solar panel on their roof that's made of arsenic? <laughs> um, <clears throat> look, at our, look at our silicon. This is quantitatively comparable with some of the most state-of-the-art materials here uh, and, and is the best known solar absorber of silicon that we have to date. Uh, I'll share with you really briefly, because um, I'm, I'm running a little long on time, I think, uh, some phenomenal updates. Uh, talk to Mike Garrett if you see him after this presentation. He's made some remarkable discoveries in the past year or so. We're now making silicon 24 single crystals. They're still small, uh, but they have 99.999% pure silicon um, in our laboratory right here. He can cut them out, orient them any way you want, uh, crystal structures and everything. And in the future, we're really excited about these technologies where we can take these structures and then grow them larger 
without using pressure. Um, so I can talk about this more later, but this was done for diamond. Uh, we can now grow diamonds without pressure as well. So we think we can adapt this technology to grow maybe someday solar panels for your roof um, that maybe if it's a one-to-one -one comparison are, are, are 300 times less expensive. Okay, the final topic, or almost final topic, is the super material. Um, this is a super strong, super hard, super conducting, and altogether tunable electronic structure material with ultra low thermal conductivity. It's called a carbon clathrate. What the heck is a clathrate? Clathrates are cage structures like this. These cages pack together to fill three dimensional space, and then they, they host atoms inside of them. And depending on how you position these atoms inside, you can tune the properties. And for carbon, these have been postulated. Scientists have been trying to make these for the past 50 years but no one's been able to make it. Why would they want to make it? One, the materials are predicted to be stronger than diamond. It's actually about the same hardness as diamond. It's a similar type of fourfold, four neighbor carbon structure, um, but the most easily cleavable plane in diamond is uh, less cleavable than that in this material. So um, this material will not break as easily as diamond. And also you can put things inside of them to change the structure. So you could start putting metals in. You could make it a semiconductor. Maybe you could make it a solar panel. If you put the right type of metal inside of it, you make it a superconductor. This prediction here isn't the highest as the H2S I showed you. This is at one atmosphere, though. The other one was at 200 elephants per pencil. 77 Kelvin is still above the boiling point of liquid nitrogen. And so talk to Li Zhu after this presentation. He did some phenomenal, exhaustive computational searching uh, for reasons I can explain later why we chose these elements, if you're interested. Um, and he found. SRB3C3. He predicted the first stable carbon-based clathrate. We have to put a little bit of boron in it uh, to, to stabilize this structure. Here are how the cages look with the, boron, with the strontium inside of it and how it packs in three-dimensional space. And we went to the laboratory with Gus Borstad. We took one of our diamond anvil cells. Here's the picture of it. And it looks like it's on fire because it is. We're actually heating this with a powerful laser to get it hot so the reaction occurs. We shine an x-ray beam through it. The x-rays interact with our sample. We get a beautiful picture on this film, which serves as a structural fingerprint. And then when we look at that fingerprint, we see these peaks here. This red line is the prediction of the clathrate phase. The black points are our experimental data. Not only do we see a peak exactly where there should be for these, uh, this, this clathrate structure, but the intensities match almost perfectly. Um, so this is you know, absolute evidence that we've synthesized this material, uh, absolute fingerprint. There are a few extra peaks here that are due to this pressure transmitting medium and some of the unreacted material. So now we have the super strong, super hard material. Um, if, and if confirmed, this one actually has a superconducting transition of 50K. If we confirm that in the lab, that will be a new world record for sort of uh, conventional superconductivity. And we can start playing all sorts of games. Um, what if we start removing some atoms like we did in our silicon? What if we move the, take them all out? What if we put different metals inside? Or what if we change the guests and the ratios of carbon and boron altogether? Um, so I really see this as a new class of supermaterials. We have a lot of work to do um, and very interesting properties. And then really quickly, just to end, we understand this energy landscape. And I hope I convinced you that in the laboratory and on the computer, Whatever our, whatever our materials are, we can find this very easily. The challenge is finding these states, the, the slightly higher energy. It's possible, but it's more difficult. We have to think of a strategy in the laboratory, like I explained to you for the examples today. Also work of Li Zhu, he has developed a new computational algorithm. This time, it not only does the structure prediction, it does the entire pathway prediction for you. So not only does it tell you what the, the start, the, the lowest energy structure should be. It tells you what to start with, how to process it, and what you'll end up with. So this is a sort of more complex three-dimensional landscape. We can navigate all around here. The name of his code is Pallas, after Athena, the Greek goddess of wisdom. So we hope to get some wisdom from this program. Here's one, this is my last slide, one example uh, of how this works. This is a network pathway diagram for all the structures of silicon. And so all of these lines, between, each of these points represents a structure of silicon. All of the lines represent all the different pathways to get there. And we can start querying this, this uh, pathway uh, calculation for information. So for example, if we want to go from um, one structure to another, 
this is the pathway that will be followed, and it, actually this is what we see in the laboratory as well. So it's very exciting. Let me uh, just conclude by thanking uh, my, my research group, uh, previous and um, current postdoctoral researchers and students, uh, my fellow faculty members at Carnegie and technical administra administrative support staff, as well as collaborators at other universities. And the funding for this work primarily came from uh, DARPA and the US Department of Energy. We have an Energy Frontier Research Center um, funded by the Basic Energy Sciences Division of the Department of Energy, and of course, Carnegie. Thank you, and I'll be happy to answer some questions. And uh, we're going to take a couple of questions and go ahead. The new materials uh, to make solar cells, are any of those water soluble? One of the problems with some of the things on the roof is. That's right, yeah. So, so sil the silicon is not water soluble. There are other, um, there's actually another class I didn't talk about at all. Uh, they're called um, perovskites, exactly. Uh, that has a major problem with solubility. The gallium arsenide, for example, as well, has a, doesn't like water. That's right. Yep. Any other questions? So, Tim, you, you talked about a 30% efficiency at best. Do you see any opportunity for any of the materials you're working on to push that efficiency higher? Sure. So not using a single junction approach. Um, so there are other ways you can sort of trick this. Uh, one way is that's using our sun. So you can, um, you can concentrate light in order to get above that efficiency. Uh, another, so you use a, uh, a magnifying glass, for example. Uh, another way you can get above that efficiency is you stack multiple band gap structures on top of each other. So one band gap absorbs the lower energy light, one absorbs the visible light, one absorbs, and you can get like a quadruple junction cell. These are actually the most advanced solar panels that go on you know, Mars rovers uh, and things to so utilize as much of that. And those get up um, you know, very high efficiency. Then there's another technology, it's called multiple exciton generation. You get two electron hole pairs for one photon ex excitation. Um, these have over 100% efficiencies. So th this is new emerging uh, technology that's really exciting as well. Are there other questions? Which one? Uh, just a, if you have a comment about the mass production of some of these things, industrial sure. scale. Sure. So, so let me just say, you know, uh, from the basic fundamental science standpoint, I think a lot of, the, you know, regardless of whether things become useful, I think this is really invaluable information uh, for understanding. From the first point, high pressure materials do have industrial application. There's over a thousand tons of, of industrial diamond produced every single year. Every single drop of oil that comes out of the Gulf of Mexico is drilled with a drill bit that's coated in little dust of diamond. And so there are factories scattered throughout the world where they have people pulling a press that goes to 6 GPA and you make diamonds. Uh, if you have a, a high enough value material, then the capital cost that goes into that can justify it. Uh, but we also have other strategies now. The ultimate goal, I would say, is making the material without using pressure. That's sort of the holy grail. We, we have this fantastic playground for remarkable materials with remarkable properties if we could only scale them. So one technology is called chemical vapor deposition. I meant to put some backup slides in. Um, but what we do is we can cut a seed crystal uh, from a, a, a basically a big, the biggest diamond we can find, or our biggest piece of silicon we can find. We put it in a reactor, and it actually grows under less than atmospheric pressure. And so we actually break down uh, molecules that contain the atoms of interest. We ionize them. They latch onto the surface of that crystal atom by atom. And we can grow up. Uh, in our lab, uh, we were growing you know, larger than 10 karat gem quality diamonds. And then that, that technology was recently licensed. Uh, there's a, a company now uh, in Washington that, that makes uh, you know, gem quality diamonds from that technology. So there, there are options. Hi. Uh, you've shown us very nice, peaceful uses of your materials. It seems to me you could just as easily make materials that could make our tanks indestructible and the military would be very interested. Sure. Uh, is the Defense Department curious about your work and how the Russians try to hire you? <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Uh, yeah, so actually, if you noticed, uh, a portion of the funding uh, it actually does okay. come from DARPA. Uh, this is the Defense Advanced Research Project Agency. Uh, one of the program managers there was very interested in new types of structural materials for armor. Um, so I don't really have any interest in, you know, designing new types of explosives or something like this. Um, but I, I think, you know, armor is, uh, is something that uh, it would be useful to, to soldiers. Any other questions? You have a question? Um, so some of you guess, tried to guess what was being printed. There was an unfair advantage, but two of our postdocs guessed correctly. <laughs> I have another one, too, if somebody wants. This is a different style. Yeah. We do appreciate you playing our little game, and um, you know you can always check out the other materials that Tim printed. He did print me a bracelet once, so that was really exciting. Um, but Amanda Lindu and Jonathan Tucker, if you are out in the other crowd or in here, you can come claim your prize. <laughs> well, th thanks, right. thanks everyone. Well, let's... and if you want a diamond cell, you can have this one. Well, let's thank uh, uh, Dr. Strobo uh, one more time so for his uh, exciting and strong talk. Great job. Great job. Uh, thank everyone for coming. And, uh, you know, be a good neighbor, and we will be here. <laughs> and thank you. Thank you.